Moving on to our next panel, ladies and gentlemen, our topic is uh, gazing into the crystal ball, investing in technologies. And I'd like you to please welcome our moderator for the session, Kanika Meyer, Partner, Investment and ESG Officer, Vertex Venture. Big round of applause, please, for Kanika Meyer. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be starting with our next panel. So... Uh, Kanika has joined uh, Vertex Ventures in 2020 and focuses on opportunities in India. She has over nine years of experience across private equity, asset management and investment banking. And prior to joining Vertex, Kanika uh, was with IFC, where she focused on investing in early stage technology, telecom, renewable energy and infrastructure companies across India and South Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and make some noise for Kanika Mayer. Our panelists today, uh, to begin, please welcome Ashish Dave, CEO, Marae in Asset Venture Investments, India. Ashish brings over 14 years of experience in the venture space. He manages Marae Assets Venture Investments, which totals around $1.5 billion with a presence in South Korea, India, and China. Earlier in his career, he worked in Mum at Mumbai Angels and Kalari Capital. Let's welcome our, se uh, our second panelist, uh, th this for this uh, panel discussion, Bala C. Deshpande, founder partner, Mega Delta Capital. Bala has 32 years of experience, of investing experience, and started her career as director of investments in ICICI Venture in 2001 and in 2008. She joined NEA at as a general partner to set up and head their India practice. She, along with two partners, co-founded Mega Delta Capital in 2018-2019. A big round of applause, please, for Bala C. Deshpande. <laughs> Let's welcome next Reema Subramanian, co-founder and managing partner, Ankur Capital Fund. Reema has four decades of experience in 0 to 1 and 1 to 10 stages of enterprises, founding a few, investing, and in operational roles. Her career has been in... Um, creating products and in future forward technology companies. Some of her notable experiences has been digitalization of financial services sector in the early 90s to ed tech at the start of internet digitalization of SMB in the late 80s. She's an active contributor to the ecosystem as a member of the executive council of IBCA and IIC. Please put your hands together for Reema Subramaniam, ladies and gentlemen. And our... Last panelist is Shuvi Srivastava, partner advisor, India Lightspeed. At Lightspeed, she looks at the internet-first businesses and is especially excited about the financial services sector, given the full potential of technology in serving the credit and investment needs of the retail user, currently ignored by the large financial institutions. Having been a founder who didn't get into product market fit, she deeply understands the psycholo psychological price of entrepreneurship. A big hand, please, for Shuvi Srivastava, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd like to hand it over to Kanika. All right, so we have a very eclectic panel here today. And I'm going to request uh, all the members to please be as candid and as controversial as you can. Uh, we're going to try and cover three themes. Uh, and I'm going to kick it off with the first one. And would love to know from everyone here, what's the one theme which is interesting and they'd be willing to bet a lot of money on in the coming years. So my preferred sector, which is more of an evergreen sector, is consumer. Uh, and I think if you're an investor in India, you have to look at all the innovations happening in the sector, both from the tech side as well as on the brand side. And we're seeing a lot more companies build for the future generation, the Gen Zs, who are now consuming more and demanding better products and services. Uh, so that's the sector I'd pick. And uh, maybe we'll start with the early stage investors here on what's the most newest and exciting theme that they're focusing on. Um, very, very excited to be here. So thank you, Vinpi and Kanika, for moderating. Um, one theme that's very hard to, hard to do with a 500 mil fund, but I'll try. Uh, so I specifically focus on consumer and fin, and I think the very interesting macro that we cannot ignore in India right now is this um, massive wealth creation that's happening. And uh, you know, over the last few years, we've uh, we've seen a variety of models emerge. There are the do-it-yourself investment platforms. There are uh, um, you know as agent-led um, wealth distribution models, and the, then there is, of course, um, 
um, the, the more deserved type platforms wherein you're looking at uh, the, the top end of the, of the mass affluence segment. I think uh, all three have a lot of potential. All three have a lot of AUM. Um, and we have made investments in one of these and looking, uh, looking forward to do a lot more there. Rima? So we're not direct to consumer. We have very few of our companies are direct to consumer. We have, we invest into typically into three broad areas and largely around AP. One is around the fact that it's IP from India for the world. And that's around science-led companies is what we invest into. And that's where we see the large opportunity coming up as well. Because, you know, whether it's uh, climate, whether it's biotech, whether it's manufacturing, there's a change of how things are being done, and that's where we see the whole opportunity as. The second large thing is the fact that in the whole digital, while the pipes have been laid out with the digital penetrations, um, there's the data and the Gen AI is now going to open up a lot more new use cases, and that's what we would go after to see the, the blocks that get built out of that. And the third around the fact that with all these digital pipes being laid out, there's still large parts of uh, the industry which is still um, in the same way as it was 100 years back. And so that's where we see the large opportunity of technologies playing the role. Uh, so we see a lot more, um, we invest more into those opportunities which are getting built out rather than the last consumer end part of it. That's, that's where our focus is on. So I think we have a good mix of some older sectors still holding up and some newer sectors emerging. And uh, maybe from the more growth investors here, you know, I think the perspective we'd like from you is that what do you think will scale in the next two, three years and will be able to aggregate a large amount of capital? So Bala, maybe to start with you, a little bit more later stage perspective on which of these themes could actually create value in the long term. Sure. I think, uh, you know, like I agree with both of them, there is immense opportunity, especially for tech first place. From, coming from a growth perspective, I think the biggest challenge that we find is that from going from zero to three, especially in a country like India, is uh, relatively discernible and easier to figure out whether this particular company will grow or not, or whether this particular business proposition will actually scale. But the three to seven journey is where we participated. And in, honestly, uh, we uh, the biggest risk that we run is hitting what we call as a growth ceiling. And that is the, uh, the lens that we wear when we look at uh, tech intensive place. Our, our fund is very focused on tech intensive place across sectors. So we are very, very excited about tech. But the reality is that the early promise of a tech Start, uh, startup or a uh, company that has reached a Series A, is that it is the profitability model really going to stand the test of scale? Is is there some is there any uh, other competitive thrust that we see that can emerge very quickly? Because the reality is tech is very very democratic, right? What is today available to you as an uh, entrepreneur is available to ten others. Uh, AWS and uh, uh, NVIDIA are making it even more easy for companies to start and come to a decent scale. So, um, but, but what, what we are really excited about is entrepreneurs whose DNA and genetic uh, uh, and, uh, code is of uh, understanding technology, pivoting with the changes, and actually trying to scale. Ashish? So the space that we are very interested in, as so our focus is early growth, growth, and late stage investment, leading into the uh, larger practice that we have on Mirai, which is the public markets. Um, we like to invest into, uh, you know, it may sound cliched, but strategies which mostly make money in the near term. Uh, and that, in our opinion, I think are two sectors for now, which is consumer and uh, financial services or fintech. Uh, that's where our portfolio is, is something which we built. And the other thing, why fintech is purely because, uh, despite all the regulatory actions, etc., we are very, very confident of it. In fact, regulators doing our job of you know ensuring the companies are compliant, and still we are going to go long on fintech companies, is because 
financial services cuts across all the consumption team, all the other things, you know, if you have to work on manufacturing or any other segment, it cuts across all of them. With digital payments coming into play, uh, it's relatively easier for you to underwrite people, which it was not possible in the cash economy. And hence, we do feel that, you know, that story stands out really well. And historically, if you look right, take all the PEs, for example, or take um, Nifty 50, right, you know, 30 to 40 percent kind of composition is BFSI. That story continues to hold true, uh, at least for the next five to ten years. Yeah. Um, you know, you pick up a mutual fund, the top holdings are always going to be this. You play India consumption story through them. Uh, so with that, we will continue to focus on that, plus consumption. Other models, in our opinion, I think they will still take some time for, you know, you know them to sort of, you know, start generating uh, money, etc. The gestation period for them can be a little longer. It will shorten over a period of time. And that's where we start looking at them subsequent five years, et cetera. But that's, that's where we are. Okay. So I'm sensing uh, a little bit of a bias from the growth stage investors. And I think uh, the point we'll cover later is you know, how metrics become important and how scale becomes important. But uh, for a lot of people here who are uh, you know, younger investors or founders, to fundamentally start up, the big question is on funding. And I think we saw a fantastic 2021, uh, lots of foreign capital coming in, you know, a lot of individuals becoming angels and backing companies. And 2022 and 23 has been a little bit more tempered, a little bit more of the product market fit question coming in early on, right? And so one perspective is that there's actually been a right sizing of the market. So if you're a founder who's truly innovating and truly building a good business, then there is enough domestic capital available, and you know these founders will continue to fundraise. But there is always the question of what happens as you scale, right? Where is the capital to help you get to an M&A or an IPO? So um, want to explore this theme a little bit, and uh, starting this time from you, Ashish. Um, you know, for institutional investors of funds, VC is one of the many asset classes that they back. And we've seen fantastic performance in public markets, um, pretty good performance in real estate, gold. So is VC still fundamentally interesting? You know, should we expect more capital to flow in over the long term? Or is this going to become you know, a 1 to percent alternate investment strategy? See, it will become interesting because it's generally the way you should look at asset, how asset classes evolve. My father started investing in real estate. Then he moved to gold. Then he moves to FD. Then he moves to mutual fund. And then he does direct stock investing. Why? Because alpha diminishes over a period of time. Where is the next alpha that you will get? Right? Also, at the same time, when you look at this context, also see there is an evolution that because he understands or she understands that particular asset class, and now I'm willing to take more risk, right? You also want to sort of move to new assets. Now, you can say, OK, what is the new asset class in town? Crypto, some people want to take that risk, some do not want to take that risk. But in the, in, in the scheme of things, right, what is regulatory, um, you know, what is allowed from a regulatory perspective, AIFs are, so probably they can. And the other thing is, because we are talking about, you know, uh, startups, because we are talking about entrepreneurship, and, you know, tell, I tell you that if India has to get to where it has to be from a developed economic perspective or, you know, uh, at a larger economic perspective, entrepreneurs will create those jobs, will create those wealth. If we have to move from $3 trillion to $5 trillion, that extra market cap is not going to be created by trading, you know, secondary shares of Bajaj Finance or HDFC. It will be created by having new HDFCs and Bajaj Finance and new companies coming into that is entrepreneur's job. So AIFs become a very interesting or venture becomes an interesting asset class from that perspective. and with so much of information. And also, you know, let's go back 10 years back, right? When Indian markets would go up when FIIs would come in, Indian markets would fall when FIIs would go out. Today what has happened is we have mutual fund industry basically is supporting, uh, you know, the, the, or bringing the liquidity in the public markets. I do feel, and that's my personal assessment, and, you know, we'll see what happens, that because of the first point that I mentioned about awareness of the asset class, we will see a lot more capital coming in from domestic people into the venture ecosystem also, right? 
because they would start participating. So we will see both of these stories play out, which are linked together. And um, maybe Bala, to add to that, should we wait for the foreign funds to come back? And you know, you would have seen many such cycles. If you know what Ashish is saying is true, then we don't have to worry so much. Uh, the Indian market is resilient enough and not subject to what's happening around the world. But you know, what's your view? And is there enough deep capital amongst your peer set to maybe fund some of the you know, themes Rima was talking about? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with Ashish. I'll add only two more points, having uh, you know, been part uh, for 10 years of a US firm, that typically I think our asset class is not more than 3 to 5%, even in a uh, country like US, and this is an NVCA data of US of the total uh, investable surplus available to a pension office, a family office, you name it. So we are naturally going to be fitting at a 3 to 5%. What's happening in India is the, that that pool of investable surplus has really started expanding in the last 10 years, whether it is thanks to ESOPs, whether it is thanks to entrepreneurs selling their businesses successfully and becoming investors themselves. We've seen so many of them, right? So that pool of what I would uh, say as, is an allocation to higher risk capital is very important. That pool has to expand, which is, it is expanding, and we are already seeing the effect of $3 trillion uh, when we reach five. Obviously, there is going to be that much more, even if we remain at a 3%-ish level of that. So I think the macros are very much in favor of domestic capital being available to India. I still think uh, US is a very significant uh, uh, source of capital for us uh, and will continue remaining so because even in the US, um, a lot of the investors are trying to look for uh, higher return uh, geographies or a much more stable return geographies, if I may say. India is not really that high compared to US tech, but China has definitely dried up. So the, uh, you know, the geographical uh, reallocations are also in favor of India. So I think um, it, it is going to be a, a good time from a supply perspective. Ja the Japanese have woken up, Australians are looking at it again, Koreans are looking at it. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, it's a good, good time, but also the truth is that our industry has become much, much larger. I still remember in 2001 and 2006, seven, I was in ICSA Venture, there were all of 10 of us uh, there were many more, but there were 10 of us ruling the roost, and we had a great party. But today, our industry has really, really become a very, uh, it's become a bubble, actually, what the typical bubble structure, where you have enormous amount of early stage funds, and you have the big boys raising money from, uh, uh, big boys raising money from global things. So the middle is where the fight is. So from a food chain perspective, I would want India to see a far much more smoother curve because the mortality rate of Series A guys is really high because they don't get the Series B or they remain small because they don't get the growth capital. So that uh, intra-industry intra corrections is what I'm hoping will happen and smoothen the curve as, as we speak. In fact, I think Series A is referred to as a death valley. So, you know, very few founders actually jump about that. And I think as we're exploring some of these newer technologies, this question becomes more relevant, right? Because someone needs to bridge the gap from an, a deep science idea to, uh, you know, a business with EBITDA, where a lot of the large funds come in. Um, so, Rima, maybe turning to you, um, you know, how should we deal with this conundrum, right? And, you know, how can we essentially encourage this ecosystem and push it a little bit more to the point where, you know, funds like theirs would actually support the companies? Sure. And I just want to add one thing to what he mentioned, right? So apart from the return perspective, it's also as the market matures, the risk-taking ability also matures. And uh, India, in the past, has always been more in a, in a safe zone. And that's where you start with real estate more than anything else, right? And um, if you really need to build as a country in the long run, 
we would need to put in a lot more work into the extractor phase, into where new technologies are getting built out. And globally, if you see, governments have been a large supporter of some of those. And then you would need to have the risky capital coming in, the risk capital coming in, or where people are willing to take those kind of risks to build those out, right? And if you see uh, the whole spaces of, you know, whether it's uh, biotech or whether it is Gen AI or whether it is the whole um, um, the compute and the, the, the whole uh, semicon space to take off, you would need a large part of international capital coming in at this point of time. The government capital will still be at a very small sliver. It will be at the base level, but it's not going to be at the growth level. So I do see is the fact over the next decade or so, or at least for the next four or five years, it is going to be international capital that comes in to support these. And that we have seen it play out in some of our companies. So for example, we have a company in climate space which converts GHGs into uh, downstream products for feed, food, specialty chemicals. But it's got international capital coming in and uh, for, the, for, for not just for India, but essentially to take it outside India. Right? So that's one large area that I see. From an ecosystem perspective, we continue to invest into creating to be a catalyst, but it is going to take time. Um, till people see that there is a maturity, they're willing to play that risk return profile and see how the money comes in, I think it's going to be international capital coming in more than Indian growth capital as well as. Because there is that gap, like she says, right, you know, a lot of growth capital is still sitting on after it matures. So one way is the fact that we go deeper, we raise larger funds to bridge that, the other is that, but it'll still continue to be a place where you will have international capital. And that good thing is the fact there's a lot of international capital which is interested in this now at this point of time. So that's where I see that. And um, so passing the ball on to Shuvi, I think international capital risk-taking ability, um, both things light speed is very well known for. So. You know, let's flip it over to the founder side. Um, assuming capital is not a constraint, you know, how easy or difficult is it for founders to raise in today's market? And then, you know, keeping in mind these perspectives, what are one or two things you would super index on when you take a very early stage, you know, pre-revenue, pre-product bet? in some of these sectors. Yeah, and, and maybe just to start off with your earlier question around capital, I feel like one of my personal biggest learnings over the last few years is that there is no dearth of capital in the world. I think there is more capital than people know what to do with. You just have to access the right pools. Um, and uh, this is a slightly controversial way of putting it, but I think India wins by elimination. Like which other growth market exists in the world? Um, and I think what we have seen now is that it can take a little longer or a lot longer than you thought, but there is so much opportunity for value creation. Like maybe people who started seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago thought that, you know, we'll have an exit in five, seven years. That's not happening. But like if you, you know, uh, recalibrate your expectations and think 10, 12 years, there's just so much value to be created. And we've seen that now. We've uh, seen a whole host of IPOs. There's a great pipeline for the next 15, 18 months. Um, so lots of international capital, very, very excited to, uh, to put money in India. Um, on, the, on the founder side, and actually that was my second point, like the biggest rate limiter to businesses is just protagonists. Like if we find more protagonists, I think there's, everyone has enough dry powder to uh, invest and the market opportunity exists. Um, and on the founder side, you're right, like seeds are in some sense, as investors, easy to do, because uh, you, you can think about, okay, is this the right neighborhood? Is this founder special? And you know, uh, there's the right founder market fit. Um, like those are, those are easier bets to take. It does get trickier at Series A, because in some sense, the risk is still all on the table, uh, but you're entering at 10 times the, the entry price, right? So I think a couple of things have happened there, if I think about 21 versus today, and 21, uh, just set the wrong watermark for a lot of us. I think a lot of founders were raising at 70, 80 million post um, Series A, uh, Series A as, uh, at that time. And when they went back to the market in the last year or two, they expected that 
that's the same story is going to play on and that obviously was nobody was biting so i think one good thing is that there's been a recalibration there are founders happy to sort of raise a series a at you know anywhere from 30 to 50 million depending on the maturity of the business um and so literally in the last quarter i'm seeing a huge uptick in the number of um series a's uh, 10 to 15 million series a's that are happening um i think the other thing that's that i'm seeing investors or vcs evolve in a way um that there's a lot more personal alpha at stake like if i again look back 3 years you know if one company has an offer then they suddenly have five offers right there was a lot of momentum investment or deal making happening today it's like and i'll tell you what i personally do there are like i know the 15 companies i'm most excited about and i'm literally going and meeting them every month uh building that relationship building an insider view on you know what the team is like how are they thinking really getting inside their heads what is actually happening in the business versus what the story you hear at the time of the fundraise um and and that is your personal alpha as an investor as a series a investor and honestly that is real investing i almost feel like the kuch to ho jayega seed investing is uh, is you know uh you don't put that much at stake and when you actually have to take risk with higher dollars is when your conviction really gets tested and your uh, um how how informed is your view are you take putting a real stake in the ground gets tested so i'm seeing that evolution happen in the market as we speak and it's all pretty recent because uh, last year everyone was a bit lost as to what's happening founders are figuring out okay why am i not raising at 100 posts and investors were like what is going on why are founders coming in with nothing and raising at 100 so all of that is getting recalibrated i'm a lot more hopeful about this year um yeah i think an, another way of saying it that, that the investors are becoming smarter right we we know at least we think we know a little bit better what to look for and yeah. therefore the conversations at series a are becoming closer to what a real business is yeah there's a lot more sanity and i mean i've been in this industry now 9 years and i can tell you 15 16 looked a lot closer to where we are today than whatever happened in the middle like this period of euphoria and sanity I, I think Shivi made a very important point. So I'm just jumping in here. I think it's very important for the Series A uh, to be disciplined because, trust me, when it comes to Series B and when I'm trying to exit to people like uh, them, that whole valuation uh, uh, valuation issue becomes so real, right? Because there is no, say, for example, in a tech company, you are talking about an ARR multiple. at an early stage you're talking about infinite times arr right <laughs> so there is really no sense but adjusting the making sure that the entrepreneur adjusts his expectation by the time he comes to series b because now i'm in talking in the realm of maybe 6 to 12 and by the time they grow and become profitable and large these guys don't give us anything more than 6 so you know there is this whole especially in technology because there are such uh, you know uh, there is so much premium laid to founders who are from the tech world who are coming up with innovative ideas the valuation at the base of any tech uh, um, any uh, tech based uh, deal is going to be super important going forward and you know as a tech focused in entre- i mean investor i really really am looking forward to the next 5 years as compared to the last 5 years as we were saying <laughs> and to your point bala i think um i do think the founders are becoming more sensitive to this um so i think there has been a period of conditioning for all our early stage portfolio where we've sort of walked through some of these constructs right and so therefore i think the conversation is becoming better on both sides the founders are willing to engage have conversation on real metrics real numbers uh and we are trying to become smarter from our side and i think one very important ecosystem development has been that we now have listed comparables in home grown tech companies so what a lot of funds like us are doing is we're actually looking at the listed market and seeing you know if this company scales in the next 5 6 years this is where the listed multiple will be and this is why this should be the premium we give for growth but you know that premium is not 50x right the premium is re- re-rating because the the natural multiple re-rating at every stage has now been fully discovered right till the end and i think that also ties in really well to the question on metrics which you were asking because um, the other great thing about having successful ipos is that it increases confidence of uh, foreign investors you know earlier the big question in india was okay we can put in the money but how are we going to get it out 
and now we have um, a few companies who've gone from seed to IPO in about 10 years and have given you know, good exits, have absorbed uh, you know, the market caps are a few billion dollars. So these are not small uh, IPOs, these are large by any standards. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more futuristic into how founders and you know, VCs and other investors should think about metrics as we lead to exit. And uh, maybe Shuvi to you, because you know, we were just talking about Series A. You know, is this a conversation even worth having at a seed or Series A? You know, should founders think about it, or is this something you would pick up much later in the journey of the company? I think founders in their first few years should not think about exits. Uh, that is absolutely the wrong thing to be solving for. And honestly, there's so much navigation just in terms of who is my uh, customer, what is my product, what is my place in their life, that you don't have the time or headspace to think about exits. Um, as investors, it's something we do think about. And at Seed and Series A, at least, um, we are more greedy about an uncapped upside versus having some sort of a base case protected. Like, we are not interested in turning, you know, I don't know, 5 mil to 20 million. Like, that is not the game we can play. Um, but we are interested in something that could have massive surface area, that could potentially go global, that can just surprise us on the upside. Like, that is at least the, the uh, angle that we pursue investments with. Uh, as you get to growth, of course, uh, you can't risk capital loss, right? I think that's the difference between early and growth. Like at early, we know we are taking mortality risk and a bunch of our companies are not going to make it. Um, and, and the ones that do should hopefully, you know, more than cover up for the ones that don't. Uh, that's the whole venture math model. Whereas with growth, I think it's the other way around. around. You don't want to uh, lose capital and you're okay with like a three to five X. At least that's how I've seen our growth team uh, operate. So yeah, early, I, I wouldn't spend so, so much time on, you know, how can this exit? But yeah, you should have some semblance of what are you underwriting. So for example, if you're and if you're investing in a lending business and you think that they'll be valued on, I don't know, AUM or revenue, uh, I think that everyone's, uh, you know, gotten enough feedback from the market uh, that, you know, a, a, a traditional finance business is a P business. So, like, think about it the right way. Uh, but if you're doing something that's more platformish, um, you know, I mean, then we talk numbers, right? Huh? Tens of millions of users and you cross sell a bunch of financial products. That upside, I think we've seen a little bit with Paytm, with Cred. Uh, so there we don't worry about this so much, but everything that's more say consumer brands uh, or traditional finance, I think we do look at exit comps to understand can this even be large or how large can this be? Um, just wanted to add that, that that's one lens, but if you're looking at really innovative technologies, uh, you need to also, so we think of exit from day one. And exit is not necessarily just money out for us, but even for the entrepreneur, when you say it's not the word exit, but looking at milestones by which you go to the next stage of getting whether it's a capital coming into the company or paying off somebody else. But essentially, the milestone is a critical thing. So I think it's important for companies to look at metrics and milestones that would either bring money in that's necessary for them to grow to the next stage or for essentially to go and exit to an earlier customer. So the milestone and metrics has to be driven from day one. And we look at it from the fact that what are the different paths that the company can take, especially when you're investing in early stage technologies, science-led companies. And it's not necessarily that everything has to be from uh, revenue and, met and uh, um, um, bottom line, because that, it depends on what kind of company it is. Because if it's like a deep tech company, which is going to take 15 years, let's say you're, diff uh, you're developing a new molecule is going to be a 10-year journey. So what would be necessary is the fact that at what stage would you need the next amount of capital and what would get that? So it could be a phase one trial, it could be a, a certification that you would need, and how do you define that, right? And we also define as to which stage would we exit at and what could be the, the, the valuation that. curve that would take place there. Ashish, care to disagree? Uh, there are enough IPOs in the pipeline as well, and you know, not all IPOs make it. So at what time should we start having this conversation with the founders? See, I think, uh, agree to what Shubhi said. Uh, we don't really think about, we don't do seed investments, but 
generally the first two years, three years, you know, probably not, don't want to sort of box it in years. You don't have to think about exit, you know, profitability. And that is exactly where venture capital comes, which is pure risk capital. Okay. I'm giving money to you. I don't know what will happen, but just use this money to come to a certain stage where the business has certain shape, form, etc. When it has that certain shape, form, etc. is when you come to the, the, the key question of company. Why do you create company? Companies are created so they, they create cash flow. I, which is where, you know, my, my disconnect sometimes with venture ecosystem, you create companies to create burning companies, cash burning companies. Company, you, you know, we do job for what? To get the salaries, right? You know, anybody does it for free? No, right? So company's whole point is to create certain cash flows so that they're sus sustainable at a certain point in time. But that question happens after you come to a stage where there is some shape and form. And when you see that, okay, I need to scale further, I need to think of IPO. Now, that's where I come, why IPOs are important. Globally, you look at any ecosystem. IPOs serve as a large liquidity mechanism. And this is very important, you know why? We had two major liquidity events in the country as non-IPO. One was Flipkart acquisition, which was acquired by Walmart. And second is where Big Basket was acquired by Tata. Two, just think how many more M&As can happen that large for the venture capitalists to get their money back or the founders to get money back, not many. Because for that to happen, you have to have large corporations in place. We have a handful of them. We will have large corporations only when they're public, right? So when the likes of Zomato, Delivery, Policy Bazaar, all these companies go big in IPO, in public market, they can become massive and then they can do M&As further. So M&As will follow later, which will serve as smaller, but still large liquidity mechanism have, have to be an IPO. And why is this important is because see, when we raise money from our investors, we have to give money back to them, right? And that money again comes back to us because see, if I take $10 from someone, I give that $10 back to them and say, okay, now give that, give that $10 back to me, right? So that's how the money has to keep rolling into the economy. So that's where the large liquidity mechanism has to come into play. And IPOs are very simple. When, when we trade a certain share price, that price captures what? It's a view of all buyers and sellers together put in one number, which is what we are discussing probably between five of us in one boardroom okay, this is what the share price should be, but that is what gets discussed between lakhs uh, of buyers and sellers, right? And we have to really say that, okay, this price, right, if what people value at, there is a lot of feedback that goes into it, based on which we basically then derive, okay, these multiples, price to book multiples, a year multiple, profitability multiple. Can we deploy a similar model when they are, now they have legs, they have profitability, they have some shape, can we use that model? Another mistake that a lot of us do is we look at an Indian company, we use the multiples that are there on NASDAQ and NYSE to value this company, which will go public in NSE and BSE. Right? I'll just say a last word here. Looking in the future, I think the way we uh, look at uh, valuation metrics also will need to change. We need to disrupt ourselves because We've seen in the last four or five years, there, are, there is something what I call as an intang X of intangible, right? The fact that you are a leader and uh, there are only two players in the food delivery market gives them, a, a, adds a premium to the valuation, which is, if you look at the classical metrics, may not make sense at all. Similarly, when we're looking at technology and looking at founders who can, uh, adopt uh, technology to India very, very um, brilliantly. Maybe they'll get a, a metric which is very different. So I think we as an industry and we as investors need to necessarily think more futuristic about how we look at valuation, starting from seed to uh, IPO. That, that is what I would say. Uh, that's a great closing remark, Bala. Uh, thanks, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please, for our panelists. And of course, we'd like to present a token on behalf of Winpay. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Amit Nauka, Partner Deals PwC, to please uh, join us and do the honors. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please, for Mr. Nauka, as he joins us on stage. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, once again, these products have been made by women entrepreneurs, and Winpay is uh, really honored to be able to give them this platform to showcase their products. Thank you to um, 
of course, Kanika for moderating the session, Ms. Ashish Dave, uh, Bala C. Deshpande, uh, Ms. Reema Subramaniam, and Shuvi Shubhastava. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights with us today. We'd like to get a group photograph as well. Thank you once again.